had a three years um, funding period followed by another year um, budget neutral extension. And I guess we are well on track. Um, I, I have to say that, or I have to acknowledge um, Tim Alsop, of course, from New Centis Pfizer, who started these efforts. So I had the pleasure um, to step in as a coordinator only um, beginning of this year, um, because the New Centis site was closed. Um, and since then, um, it is my pleasure and some pleasure, I have to say, to act as a coordinator, because there is a lot of paperwork uh, involved. And you will see why uh, in the following. I hope that everything is set. Yes, here we are. So um, I'm supposed to give you a brief overview on what EBISC was or is and what the future of EBISC is going to look like. And um, because I'm, I'm from the F an FPR uh, employee, I'd like to give you a bit of an um, impression of what the FPR group or the FPR company think such an EBISC or IPS repository uh, should look like or what we are mostly interested in. And uh, uh, as a disclaimer, I have to say I'm, I'm an employee of Janssen, so this is a disclosure. Um, and I can give um, this sort of, uh, sort of an introduction only from the Janssen perspective. And to be more specific, it is from the Janssen neuroscience perspective. So I'm working at uh, Janssen in, in Belgium um, as a group leader, scientific director in the neuroscience department, and we are mostly interested in Alzheimer's disease. And you can probably see from um, these, uh, from this industry perspective, that it is somewhat neuroscience focused. So, what is our perception about the IPSC technology? I mean, w we are we are experiencing since a couple of years a boost in the IPS technology. Um, we are bombarded um, as the FPI company with requests to collaborate. Um, there are more and more IMI projects that are in the process of being funded or that just started, or this one um, which is now closing down, um, that have an significant focus on the IPS technology. Um, what I'd like to um, underline here is what, what we think um, is needed. So first of, first of all, we still are under the impression, or we think that IPS are a preclinical research and development tool. So we are not yet uh, at a stage where we consider IPSC to be a therapeutic. I know there are a couple of um, activities ongoing for macular degeneration or so, where IPSCs are being developed as a, as a therapeutics, but in, in the neuroscience area, at least where I come from, this is mostly neurodegeneration, we consider IPSC as a preclinical tool. Um, we would like to use these IPSCs um, to study the pathophysiology, uh, and um, for studying neurodegeneration, we need to have access to neurons, astrocytes, microglia, and all human origin, and you can imagine that it's pretty complex to get hands-on primary uh, material um, for these cell lines. So therefore, the IPSC uh, technology is of interest um, to us. Um, what for? So first of all, we would like to understand the disease phenotype. Um, we would like to then set up screening assays. So we need large amounts of these IPSCs in order then um, to study uh, any phenotypes that, that uh, um, are um, detectable in these cells and then reverted by small molecule approaches, for instance. And this all to help bridging the gap from preclinical tools, mouse models whatsoever, uh, and these have their limitation, especially if it's down to neurodegeneration, um, to then human, human studies. Um, so another important point is, I mean, w we, are, we are pharma. We would like to use these tools in order to deliver into project portfolio. So we have a certain question that we would like to answer. So for instance, how to stop power pathology? And we would like to use IPSCs to answer these questions. It's not the much about um, basic research. Um, we would like questions to be answered in order to progress our portfolios. Um, so we have not the time um, to study and study and develop essays and technologies in order to make them tool. So we would like in ideal world to take a developed IPS line, IPS differentiation protocol, to uh, then forward it to our laboratory and start experiments. And uh, the last bullet point is something that I collected um, from the FPR partners within IBISC. And uh, it, it basically says um, what I have alluded to already. We have the readout from IPSCs in some discovery projects, but so far, at least in our shop, IPSCs have not yet been in the position to drive decisions.
but uh, I hope that uh, in future we will we will come to this. So, <coughs> what what is our expectation then? So, what is the must? What does the IPS technology for for at least my business uh, uh, need to deliver? Most importantly, it needs to be re reproducible and robust. And um, in an IMI, we we started in Ebisc. Uh, we started cross laboratory experiments where we sent IPS lines out and where we uh, um, asked the different partners to use the very same differentiation protocol, the very same treatments, the very same readouts in order to then assess, do we get the same data? Do we get the same results? I think this is absolutely important because the reproducibility of publication or so is a concern um, to, to us and I guess to the, to the scientific community in general. We would like to have confirmed disease phenotypes in these lines. So say if we, if we have a, uh, an IPS line, for instance, from a patient um, uh, suffering from frontotemporal dementia, for instance, we would like to have a phenotype that we can reliably detect in these lines in order then to subject these lines to phenotypic screenings, for instance. Uh, and this needs to be uh, um, re reproducible again. Um, in an ideal world, we have document documentation um, attached to these lines. So we have um, standard operation procedures. We have the differentiation protocols that we can access when we, for instance, uh, purchase an IPS line from the uh, EBISC repository, for instance. Uh, and um, important uh, as well is that um, access to um, patient records, clinical data, the whole genome sequencing, for instance, um, is available as well. So. I mean, um, if I'm studying, a, for instance, a line from an Alzheimer's disease patient, I would like to know, um, are there uh, um, SNPs that have been linked via um, genome-wide association studies to Alzheimer's, yes or no? What is the APOE phenotype, for instance? And I've seen one poster outside where <coughs> which claims um, that this information is partially available already within EBISC. Very important for us is the uh, uh, force bullet points, is the freedom to operate. Um, when we started with IPS um, work at Janssen, uh, we were approaching um, small biotechs, um, uh, university uh, groups, and asking for IPSCs. Um, in order then to get these IPSC into Janssen, this uh, um, triggered a huge amount of negotiations and contractual legal work. So it is not easy to just approach someone, ask for the IPSC lines to be sent to Janssen, we start working. Um, there are often not the correct consent forms, the patient consent forms attached to it. Um, tech transfer offices seem to be sometime um, thinking they can add re um, reach through claims to these collaboration agreements, and this is all not something that we would like to have in place. We would like to use these cell lines and use the data that we get for research and development purposes. I'm not talking of about commer commercialization or so. Um, Related to this is the ease of access and the deposition. Um, again, the legal and administrative burden is often prohibitory um, to, to get IPS lines in-house. At a certain time and point, we were just saying, okay, leave it. Um, the work attached to it is, t is uh, 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 more than we would accept. So it is uh, um, not matching what we expect as an outcome. Um, of course, um, we, we, we are following the IPC offering um, from the outside, um, and this needs to fit with our internal research and development pipeline. So we are flexibly, flexible uh, with regard to tools. I, I mean, as you all see the CRISPR-Cas uh, technology evolving, we are now uh, switching from patient-derived IPS line to gene-edited cell lines because we then have the proper controls, uh, and this is something that um, we have on our radar and needs to be monitored constantly. And at the end of the day, um, we need to deliver results. So in my goals and objectives, for instance, I says um, you have to deliver X at the end of 2017 or 18. So an IPSC technology needs to deliver into the projects uh, um, within a commercial entity. I mean, this goes probably without saying. I'm happy to take any question if there is one already now. This is, uh, well, how this do you deal with that? 
I'm not dealing with it because I'm not a lawyer, but... Uh, well, you know, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you you're, you're right. Um, this is uh, um, something that has been dealt with in EBISC. So we had one work package dealing uh, um, uh, entirely with, with um, the legal aspects, the ethical, bioethical aspects. How does an informed consent need to look like? Um, can we harmonize it across Europe, which is difficult indeed. Um, so currently there is an, incent, uh, uh, consent, uh, an informed consent uh, document available with an EBISC, which we, for instance, also send to Stembank or to other entities uh, or collaborative projects um, that you make use of these informed consents. And I guess it's fair to say this gives a relatively good coverage of what's possible within Europe. But again, I'm, I'm not a, uh, uh, um, a lawyer, so that's all I can say to this. But you're right, this is difficult. Especially if it's down, for instance, to uh, um, adding whole genome sequencing data to these RPS lines. Um, and this is especially difficult in Germany. Um, but uh, this is, again, this is something that needs to be worked on. You're right. So now a bit to the history. EBISC started in January 2014. It was uh, um, kicked off or initiated by New Centers, uh, by Tim Alsop. Uh, and uh, it was supposed to run until uh, 2016, end 2016. Um, the rationale is, it was pretty clear, and it's all again related to what I, what I uh, mentioned before. Um, the IPS landscape um, is fragmented across Europe. Every, there are lots of small biotechs, uh, universities that have IPSCs developed, um, and it's, it's, it would have been beneficial if we can centralize this offering into a one uh, uh, banking entity. Um, and what comes uh, along with these fragmented spectrum is that the um, quality of the IPS cells is quite diverse. Depends on whom you approach. Um, the identity of the IPS cell lines is not guaranteed. Um, there is no phenotype information attached to it. It is, it takes, a, it took a great, uh, um, a, a lot of time to get hands on because of this legal um, aspects. And, and often we, we were stuck in, in um, discussions and as to what extent we can use these IPS cell lines for our internal research. Um, and this is not only true for, um, for commercial entities, I guess this holds also true for, for public entities. And therefore, um, the initial goal was to establish such a um, European-wide repository which takes um, over the most of these questions here and um, by this minimize duplication effort. So let's say uh, there is an AD-derived cell line uh, Lily is, for instance, interested in, they start in negotiations with a certain group. If Pfizer is interested in, they do the very same thing, and so on and so forth. If this has been done once, and this cell line is deposited at EBIS, you go there, you order the cell line, you can start working with. So this is one negotiation, that's it. This would uh, make use of, a great use of synergisms across, uh, across Europe. And um, importantly as well, um, and this was one of the goals of the IMI, um, they are closely following sustainability questions, that this banking entity um, at the end of this uh, uh, funding period is self-sustainable. So all the IPS lines that have been generated are available via this IPS repository also beyond the runtime of the project. So um, to the specifics, the EBISC project, again, was uh, funded for three years uh, and then um, experienced a budget neutral extension uh, in until the end of this year. So this is his last uh, um, EBISC one, let's phrase it this way, meeting, I guess. Um, and uh, December 31st, um, EBISC is history. I mentioned just the, the formal uh, collaboration agreement, but um, the IPS lines will be available beyond this, uh, thanks to uh, ECAC and, and Fraunhofer, um, who are willing to secure the lines in the repository. Um, it was a huge project. Uh, it had 26 partners across Europe, um, FPI companies uh, uh, and governmental um, authority um, universities. And um, the initial goal was to collect uh, up to 1,000 IPS cell lines that will be available via the uh, central um, IPS repository. We have uh, established um, two facilities. Um, one is now being, is now ECAC and the other one is located at, uh, uh, in Germany uh, at the Fraunhofer, who are yeah, running the mirrored bank, which 
uh, I guess you can agree is important in order to secure the um, survival of these lines. Um, another work package was dealing with um, the proof of concept. Um, how can we use these IPSCs in discovery projects? And this relates to what I just mentioned before, sending out IPS lines to different uh, laboratories and then running the very same protocols in order to uh, prove that um, we are in the position to having um, reproducible differentiation protocols and readouts in place. This is a consortium. You can see it's spread across Europe. Um, there's just one uh, comment I would like to make. You see, for instance, um, the Spanish partner, and this is going back to what I just mentioned with access to lines. Uh, when we were starting with the IPSC uh, um, work, um, we were planning to get IPS lines from Spain into the central repository, and this is not foreseen in the Spanish legislation. So we, we, um, we had to stop these efforts, and this relates back that it m does really make sense um, to go for a uh, Europe-wide harmonized um, repository and uh, um, agreements. So um, what is the core business of EBISC? What was the initial um, goal? We have the um, research projects all over, all over Europe, uh, and we have then um, other researchers that might be interested in getting hands of these IPS lines. So then the goal was, okay, let's, let's establish this IPS repository, which takes over IPSCs generated and makes the access of these IPSC lines to other researchers easy. Um, and this via the central facilities, being the central or the mirror facility. Um, the constant forms and contracts uh, need to be harmon harmonized. This was the goal in order not to renegotiate again and again access to lines. Uh, common standards and QC processes for all of these lines. So you, if you buy a cell line from this repository, they have undergone the very same QC procedure. Um, there are precise SOPs for each step uh, um, established, which makes sure that you get what you want to, to have in-house. A data management system attached to these lines, storing, for instance, uh, differentiation protocols, uh, sequencing data, phenotypes, and um, Researchers that make use of the IPSCs are actively approached and uh, asked to deposit data they generate with these lines um, into this information management system. Um, I mentioned already the, the catalog, which is in the process of uh, um, being yeah, larger and larger currently. I don't know where we stand with the cell lines, but there are a couple of hundreds already available. And um, there are ongoing discussions to internalize, for instance, uh, cell lines that have been established within the IMI standard. Um, project. And then, of course, um, validating these uh, process by phenotyping of selected lines. This goes back again to the reproducibility of um, what can be achieved with these lines and these resources. So this is now um, where we stand currently. But um, again, IBISC ends this year, and the question is, what's then? Now. This goes back to the question of sustainability. IMI is very firm with uh, um, making sure that everything which is established with an IMI project um, is sustainable. So it does not mean we have a project funded for five years, the project closes down, everything is lost. Um, so th we are actively asked to make sure this does not happen. Um, so for this purpose, and I don't want to go too much into history, um, how EBISC-1 was planned and executed, um, we have now started to discuss with IMI and the FBI companies to um, launch a follow-up call um, in order to make um, the EBISC repository or the um, European banking entity, which is currently being taken over um, by ECAC, this is a legal custodian of the IPS lines, um, is able to further develop these lines to reach the self-sustainability. Uh, so in the current um, call topic text, which has been published recently. This is a draft. The final one is going to be published this month, I guess. We have 10 FBI companies uh, identified who are interested in a following up project. And this underlines uh, how important we, from the industry um, perspective, um, value such a repository. Um, the financials have been agreed upon. The budget is close to be fixed. And um, we aim for another three years of duration. 
focus of the new consortium, this is laid out in the core topic text, is um, the banking distribution and expansion of lines. So this is really the core business of an IPSU repository. Um, we would like to ask a new consortium to add another um, flavor, which is about production of lines. So we, again, in one of my first slides, I was saying um, in an ideal world, we take something from shelf, we transfer it to our uh, um, laboratories and then start screening. This means, for instance, we would like to order a billion cells NPC state, which we can then plate and start screening in order not to invest our resources in such an effort. Um, currently, the core therapeutic areas um, we are talking about is neurodegeneration, diabetes, cardiovascular safety, but um, the call is open for other indications as well. Again, the final call topics is currently being launched is with the European Commission currently for final approval, and um, I hope if everything goes right and fast, that uh, the new activities can start by the end of 2018. So this is something for um, the future of and potentially EBISC 2. So what's the benefits? Um, I mean, you can read through um, this pretty busy slide, uh, but it's basically what I uh, already mentioned um, in, in my talk. Um, we will establish and derive new lines. They will be constantly integrated in the new IPS repository. Um, one thing the new um, bank needs to cons consider is how to incentivize, um, for instance, uh, groups at the universities to donate or to give or hand out their cell lines in order those to be integrated. This is something which has not been really successful in the past. Um, we have and this is important for everyone, we have a high quality backup. So if our cell lines are contaminated, we can always go back and, and order new cell lines. And we can be sure because of the, S, uh, the QC process that the cell lines are the very same that we ordered in the first instance. Um, this is what I just mentioned. Um, we hope that the new consortium will be able to produce bulk quantities so we can order not only a vial, but let's say uh, a 100 vials in order to accelerate our internal processes uh, and research development activities. Um, and um, I appreciate that the training that has been offered by the current EBIS consortium, uh, the, all the um, workshops were pretty successful. Um, and I guess there is a, a lot of online uh, tools available in order to, to train newcomers to IPSC technology. And this is also important uh, to harmonize um, how the process of how to deal with a certain cell line, how to differentiate, how to put them in culture, and so on and so forth. And I guess the um, new EBISC will continue with um, what the, this EBISC project uh, has, been, has been prepared and accomplished. Okay, sir, no questions? So how is the liaison with the other banks, for example, those in the US? Because there seems to be a lot of overlap and duplication. And for example, Richards is, has, seems to have all the distribution issues pretty, pretty solved. Um, I'm aware that there are lots of IPS banks in the United States. Um, in an ideal world, um, the European, so this EBIS or the new EBIS is going to join efforts uh, to exchange lines and to make use of synergisms. It's basically something that we, this is my perspective, um, that's what EBIS came for, is to make use of synergies in Europe with regard to IPCs, and I, I don't think that it shouldn't be possible also to do it worldwide. But I guess um, EBIS is leading um, with regard to the quality control of the IPS lines, and uh, I guess um, other, other um, IPS repositories need to adapt to, to the quality standards that EBIX is offer, offering. Although the NIH NCATS program has got um, most of it going with ribo robotics, which seems to go very well, and as does the New York Stem Cell Foundation. So there are quite good um, banks being developed elsewhere. And I wondered whether the dialogue was ongoing or not. Uh, I have not been involved in this, this dialogue, but one of the um, goals of the new call is, in, in fact, to reach out to other repositories to make sure they are talking to each other and there is no duplication of efforts uh, at, at the best of what's possible. I mean, w when I was um, starting um, some IPS work at Janssen, um, there, were, there were calls out 
they were saying, okay, we will derive 500 IPS lines from AD patients, and we will derive another 1,000 from Parkinson patients. No one in the world can characterize these lines. There's no way into it. So it, it needs to be a rethinking, and uh, I, I, I guess the characterization of the IPS lines and, and also the, the reach out to other uh, activities and collaborations is of, of utmost importance. I'd, I'd like to add that, for instance, one, one goal of this new call is as well to, um, to survey what's going on in Europe. I mean, there are so many projects um, that develop IPSCs that are funded by the European Commission or, or by, by governmental uh, funding bodies. And all these lines, they vanish and within the universities. They are not accessible, although they have been developed with public money. And it does definitely make sense to, to get these cell lines into the repositories. Well, maybe along those lines, um, <coughs> how do you deal with cellular therapy, possible cell cellular therapy coming after using iPS cells for, for that? Is there an idea to develop a protocol how you can get an IPS cell line which is non-GMP into a GMP setting so that it could be used also in a clinical cell therapy setting, which is which are the other side of the banks, right? I mean, what is built up in Japan in the moment is really banks which go into cellular therapy, right? Yeah, cellular therapy is not in the focus of the of this uh, uh, was not in the focus of this effort, and it won't be in the focus of the new uh, um, EBISC um, exercise. I, I, I agree, it's, it's important, but this um, probably is something for a new call to deal with this because there are um, quite some challenges attached to this as well, which cannot be covered here. Sorry, let me just address the question. The CERM collection, which Cellular Dynamics helped put together, um, we kept back bank PBMCs, so if anybody wanted to go make GMP lines those uh, materials are available from the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine to do so. To take the lines that we made and put them into a GMP facility is not something the FDA is allowing at this point, but you could go back to the original material if you wanted it. But there could be protocols which allow you to fertilize those cells back into the facility. There are protocols. The FDA, I think, uh, Christine was with me at NCATS. The FDA and the NCATS people were there talking about how you could move those materials. But the original donor samples are still accessible, and they were kept because the idea is that we may not be making uh, pluripotent stem cells in exactly the way you might want to make them going forward in the future, and you would need that resource material to access. Further questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.